Revenge, the return, game two, however you want to categorize it, qualify it, qualify it. Auburn versus Cal is happening yet again. One year later in game two of both our seasons, Auburn will welcome this time the Cal Golden Bears to the loveliest village on the plains. And as they were so gracious as host yesterday, or not yesterday, last year, it feels like it was yesterday, uh, being host for us. Now the return trip is here. We need to talk to somebody from the other side. So I'm pleased today to have with me Thomas Dunn. And he is what I will go ahead and categorize him as, whether he wants to admit it or not, an expert on all things Cal Golden Bears and uh, football for them. So I would love uh, to welcome you, first of all, Thomas. But uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you do in relation to the Cal Golden Bears? I uh, appreciate you having me on, Kyle, and uh, glad to connect with your community and uh, rekindle with the Auburn community once again after last year. So they had a they had a blast out here based on what I saw. Lots of Auburn fans mingled with the Cal crowd that I'm a part of uh, and mingled in tailgates pregame on campus before we matric matriculated up the long hill and the long walk up to <laughs> California Memorial Stadium. Uh, that walk, uh, I'm still not prepared for it uh, after years of doing it. Uh, it still agonizes me to no end. So I'm hoping uh, the walk to Jordan-Hare Stadium from where I'm at in Auburn, it's a little more flat, uh, per se. <laughs> but I grew up uh, in the Bay Area, uh, grew up a Cal fan, uh, grew up around the 2000, late mid late to mid-2000s uh, era of Cal football, uh, right when Auburn was also at one of their peaks uh, as a program. Uh, mm -hmm. Back when we had Aaron, Aaron Rodgers, back heading into like Kevin Riley in 2007, um, we ranked up to second at that point. So that was kind of my introduction to Cal. And you know, I think a uh, five to six-year-old me was a little too naive about what I was getting into. Because you get to, you only get to so many games of how many times in a row can we lose to Nevada? How many times in a row can we give their team the first one <laughs> of the season? And then you know I get to high school and college. And I'm like, oh, can maybe I can seriously make a career out of it because I love my team so much that, that I become their biggest critic. Yeah. So it becomes a point of you got to show me something. I'm not just going to sit here and blindly hold your hand as you try and get to the altar. You got to make sure that this relationship is going to be worth it, or else you're not going to get the full backing of what it could be. So in my case, once I turned into college and now as of right now, just a recent college graduate, uh, I've been covering the California Golden Bears for three years now. And uh, I've seen some good. I've seen some bad. I've seen some downright ugly. So uh, and the funny thing is, is you never know which one of those sides you're going to get with Cal on any given week. So that's the that's the story of being a, one, a Cal fan two covering Cal. And because, you know, it's never going to be a dull moment. Well, it sounds very similar to the Auburn experience, and that's part of our name here and what we talk about. And we call it, in some sense, a roller coaster ride. So it sounds like we share that similar connection of one minute you're talking about a number two team and uh, you know being the talk of the nation, and the next thing you're trying to figure out, how on earth are we losing to this team right now? We have faced our fair share even recently of those type of questions, uh, and that was last year. And um, so it sounds like we are kindred spirits, maybe just on different coasts in some ways. You know, I would I would not rule that out. I mean, I look at the I hate to bring this up for you guys, but the New Mexico State game last year. There it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. You know, it was low hanging fruit, but it was there. Um, it was there. And then for us, 2022, Colorado went one and eleven right before they fired their coach and hired Dion. I wonder who that one team was that they beat. Mm. The California Golden Bears. And I was there in Boulder to witness that um, a team that was giving up 300 yards rushing per game, 0 and 5 interim coach, and then Cal proceeded to give up 11 TFLs that game. So mm -hmm. you just want a, a vibe check of what Cal can be on any given week. I yeah. saw it right then and there because other times it's oh there's an injury here and all of a sudden our 15th ranking from 2019 and 4 and 0 is falling by the wayside. And mm -hmm. another time it's like we don't have the right quarterback. What do we do when we have a star running back that's sitting right here and is going to go to the NFL after this year? Can we can we get it all lined up together at once? So that's really yeah. what being a Cal fan can be at certain times. Well, speaking of quarterbacks, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring this up. Thank you for Sam Jackson, uh, although uh, he's I a wide receiver I'm, for us. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to end up saying you're welcome, to be honest. You, you, well, may, want to uh, return to, you may want to return to sender package at some point. How about this? He's already got a touchdown in game one, and it was an incredible touchdown to the playing wide receiver for us. Uh, I, did, I, I did see that. I, I will be I'll be honest. I was shocked uh, that uh, he not, not 
that had doubts in his ability as a college athlete. I mean, all these guys, let's be honest, that are out there are way better than you and I would ever be. And yeah. we are not even worthy of, of licking their shoes essentially, but it was just an incredible play and play one. And we've got all these great wide receivers at Auburn this year. At least it seems that way so far. And you, you just kind of had him lower in the pecking order of people to get a touchdown in game one. Uh, but it's a cool storyline, obviously connective tissue here for what we're talking about today between Auburn and Cal. Um, and in reference to what you said, I heard story after story after story of the great experience that Auburn fans had uh, visiting you all last year and uh, that incredible sunset view or, or just the mountains, I believe, is what it, what's in the background back there. It looks like a great place to watch a college football game. And uh, obviously the game was pretty wild and a little, I think, frustrating at both times for everybody. We'll certainly talk about maybe impressions of how especially you think it might go uh, a little bit this year. But I, I want to dive into, before we talk about what's going to happen, what do Auburn people need to know about this year's Cal team? Because we can talk about Sam Jackson and us having him now. We can talk about last year's game. But what we're talking, what we're focused on is what may or may not happen within the confines of Jordan Hare uh, on this Saturday. By the way, it looks like it'll be okay weather. The temperature looks pretty favorable for you guys. We were wanting to give you a good old slice of that 95 high humidity that maybe you guys don't have over there. <laughs> but uh, it looks like we might have mid-80s and a slight chance of rain. So that humidity might come into play, Not, um, but not too much of the heat that we were hoping to give you guys. I don't know if you're accustomed, if you've been down here and felt that ever. Yeah, so just, I'll start with the weather part. Uh my main experience with that type of weather is Houston, Texas. Um, yeah. I went there once and it was 105 and raining. So that was a, that was a fun time. All things considered. Uh, I've, I've been to my fair share, like Maryland, DC, North Carolina in that area with their type of humidity. Uh, right now, actually uh, I'm in the Bay area and our summers are weird. Um, I will say that uh, there are summers actually right now it's September, October without fail years on end. That's just how it happens to be. And like today where I'm at, I'm about five to seven miles from the Pacific ocean and the coast mm -hmm. and about 10 minutes outside San Francisco. And it's about 88 degrees and it feels like an oven because mm -hmm. you don't have that many people that need to enact their air conditioning. Cause it's usually between 50 and 70 on any given day. So when you get out here in Berkeley, it's hotter. Berkeley is about 30 minute drive away. It should be, should have been about 90 plus so mid low nineties today. So the team mm -hmm. should have been practicing and rejoicing in the fact that they're probably going to get at least somewhat of a simulated package for what the weather yeah. may be Saturday. Um, and then when you reference like the new look team, it's the, the attempt at a revamp of a new offense. So lots of new okay. guys were brought into Weiss Merriweather from Notre Dame, Keon Grays from Ohio State, lots of new linemen, Will McDonald from Coastal Carolina, uh, Rush Reimer, Montana State, lots of just new injection of life really in an offense that really they gritted their teeth at times last year. They're, they have obviously their – what can be classified as an all-American star in Jaden Ott, but at some points it was only Jaden Ott. And now mm -hmm. it's getting to the point where we finally have someone who can walk with him and run with him and say, here, let me help walk you to the promised land. Um, yeah. The issue is some of the guys are hurt already. So I have a, I had a sticky note here of all the injuries that we have right now. And this is just the <laughs> oh. one. So oh, wow. we have uh, Jaden Ott starting running back, all-American, like ta level talent. Uh, he got hurt and we have no idea if he's going to play. Uh, okay. Just we'll said probable. I'm skeptical of that qualification, to be honest. I don't think, based on what I saw, I don't think he'd be any healthier than 80% uh, on okay. Saturday. Uh, his backup running back took one carry, uh, got a helmet to the sternum, fumbled, scoop and score, also injured. Uh, mm -hmm. Starting left tackle got hurt, came back. Starting center did not play. Backup center got hurt, came back. Starting right guard did not play. Uh, Merriweather from Notre Dame did not play. Uh, Gray's the transfer from Ohio State did not play. The wide receiver five also did not play. Um, that's a lot of players, very many players. Um, so when you look at this revamped offense under a Cal offensive coordinator, Mike Blesch, it's largely now some of the same players from last year. So wide receiver turned scholarship player, Tron Grizzell, who was really good last year, had around 700 receiving yards or so, really burst on the scene and really was a gem for the coaching mm -hmm. staff. Uh, tight end Jack Andrews, the same thing. Walk on, turn scholarship player, someone who we didn't really know what we had. And then, Chief among them, Fernando Mendoza, the quarterback who was third string last year behind Sam Jackson the fifth and Ben Finley, and took the reins and took him by storm and never let go. So when you look at Cal and their new look offense, it's really a lots of new parts, new parts that we don't really know if they work yet, and right. still some of the old guard. But they're going to need that to mesh and hopefully mesh quick because some might play this Saturday, some might not play. 
But regardless, regardless of the fact, at some point they will need to in, in order for Cal to enact the bigger ceiling that they really want. Again, the connective tissue just continues because that it's a very similar story, not with the injuries. And you might have probably been better served just to say with who is going to play rather than who's not going to play. It might have gone a little bit quicker. Uh, Y'all have just been hit by that injury bug. I mean, what's going on up there? Like, is it just is it just one of those fluke things or are these, are these some of these nagging injuries that have just kind of gotten tweaked during the early part of uh, the season and fall camp? I think it's a mix of everything. Some guys, it's just like – we Cal practices on turf and we know how like okay. turf, sometimes your leg can stick yep. and then you get twisted and then you get a significant injury out of it. So sometimes it's just like the variance of that. Other times some guys are were in, not in a boot one day and now all of a sudden they are in a boot the next day when we come back to practice and we're like, yeah. what just happened? I saw our starting safety pull his hamstring during fall camp and was out for basically the next two weeks and was questionable heading into the Davis game in this past weekend and was on a bit of a pitch count. So I'm intrigued to see if he's fully 100% right now or if he's at 90 or because we all know how nagging a hamstring is. But it's really a mix yeah. of everything, just the physicality of football, the variance of football, and then also just camp injuries. I mean, some guys, they get perpetually hurt. That's kind of just the deal. Some people you have to yeah. take a chance on a transfer portal thinking, I can give them a new start, but maybe that ends up not being the case. In the yeah. case of Kyle, the injury is just kind of like whack-a-mole of, oh, here's one here, here's one there, here's another one there. It's – we're trying, just trying to settle it down and pull back the reins and just see, all right, who do we who do we know that we're going to have for the bulk of the season? Because right now yeah. we truthfully do not know. And when people have asked me, hey, who's going to play this Saturday against Auburn? I'm like, I wish I could tell you because the answer is I don't know. And the coaching, <laughs> right. the coaching staff is notorious for keeping their cards to the chest, being very coy and not giving out like direct information unless like you're really pressing for it. And even then it'll be like, uh, if it's a leg injury, oh, it's a lower body injury, something like that. Right. So we just, right. it's a lot of back and forth push pull, and you, you kind of just figure it out when you walk in the stadium. Well, new look offense, maybe some familiar faces by necessity of the injury situation. Uh, either way, I, I'm hoping that that doesn't become a factor because as a college football fan, I want a good game. Yes, of course, you want your particular team to win. But to me, I'd rather get someone's best and beat them at their best. So hopefully whoever does play for you guys in this game, it'll end up being a great game and a great performance out of all of them. What you did mention Ott. Obviously, that's probably the one player that Auburn fans are focusing on. You already answered the big question and what your speculation on that is. If you had to pick one other player on offense that Auburn fans need to pay attention to, who is going to be an X factor offensively for Cal in this game, who might it be? Yeah, I'm going to go with someone who has been used in multiple roles at another school and has achieved a pretty moderate success. And it's a uh, tight end, Corey Deitches, a uh, transfer okay. from Maryland, who has come into Cal and with the <clears throat> with the role of being a receiving tight end. I mentioned Jack Andrews earlier. He's mainly a blocking tight end and served to be helpful in the run game. A can catch Corey Deitches, you can line up in the slot you can get a mismatch if you pull a linebacker on him. And I think with the rash of injuries at the wide receiver position and the unknown status of everybody, you can maybe push him out towards the slot or even try and get him one-on-one -on, -one on the outside with a linebacker, pull him out and see what type of defense Auburn is running just in terms of maybe not necessarily executing a 50 yard catch, but just getting the plane, getting to know what the playing field is going to be like, because mm -hmm. he's someone where you have to put resources to, you can't just let him run free. And Fernando Mendoza did a solid job of hitting him across the seam for some catches last week against UC Davis. And you'll need more of that considering you're not going to, you may not have some of your boom guys who can go game break for you. So Corey sure. Judges is a guy who I, who I look at, someone who's been a veteran over in the Big Ten Conference and achieved some success over there and is a freak athlete in some respects to go out and be a guy that Fernando Mendoza says, I need you right now and then yeah. try and get to the promised land. Well, it sounds like that will be a necessity, especially dealing with all the injuries, having some of those guys you can rely on, uh, whether Ott's in the game or not. Obviously, uh, that's a big factor, but uh, I, I think we're going to get a good fight out of the Cal Golden Bears offensively regardless. Let's move to defense and talk about that. I'm going to – I think I have these numbers correctly because Coach Freeze for Auburn has talked about them enough in the many press conferences appearances that he's already done this week. 44-7 and seven on the defense, I think – is the numbers correctly you may be able to give us some names around that but those are the people that he continues to bring up when he was talking about who is auburn paying attention to especially when they, they got to find a way to lock them down they got to find a way to know where they're at on the field if i have the numbers correctly or if you can clarify that a little bit more what, what are your thoughts on defense yeah, so this will be a bit of a two-part answer. So Freeze is correct. Uh, 44, Xavier Carlton, and 7, David Reese are the two best pass rushers that Cal has. But 
what Hugh Freeze saw last year and what Auburn saw last year in some cases can be classified as an anomaly. So mm -hmm. Cal, their conference last year in the Pac-12, they started on September 24th against Washington. They didn't record their first sack in conference till October 28th against USC. A whole mm -hmm. month without a single sack. Nobody in the backfield, no nothing. Quarterbacks could five could have five course meals back there. <laughs> so you look at that and you're like, Auburn fans are like, what just happened? What happened to the elite defense that we faced? And the truth of the matter is, is Cal's defense fell off a cliff last year compared to recent expectations that have been had under this coaching regime. They gave up 52 to Oregon State, gave up 59 to Washington, gave up 63 to Oregon, gave up 50 to USC. That's four really, really bad performances. And then you look at it, they faced Utah. They had a safety turn into a running back and rush for like 170 yards on them. So it just leaves everyone puzzled as what just happened here. And I think Auburn would be chief among them. And that's not to say that Reese and Carlton can't perform because they single-handedly won us games against Washington state and UCLA and helped us rise from a three and six record and become bowl eligible. Mm -hmm. But it comes to a point of proof of concept. They got to do it consistently yeah. for me. I, I'm not going to sit here and say, Oh, it's just because they have another year in the system and a lot more talent around them that, it's automatic that Cal's going to generate more sacks. Sure. It's just that it's, yeah. it's, it's foolish to understand when you have the same nucleus, largely the same nucleus, that you're going to get different results. So Cal, for me, on that on that line, they got to prove it. They got to get yeah. multiple sacks per game each week and leave no doubt. Because if they don't, it's just going to be like, well, you're expecting the linebackers and the secondary to do more than is reasonably asked. And I think yeah. one guy to look out for that Hugh Freeze does not know about because he didn't play against Auburn last year is now number zero, Kate Uluwabe who uh, had his first start against Oregon State like week five last year, took the reins inside linebacker, never let go, and you can almost classify him as like an agent zero, if you will, because mm -hmm. he really, really showed some things that people were not expecting and has said, this is my linebacker room now, and I dare someone to do something about it. Yeah. One of the things that Cal, as you address, whether it's anomaly or whatever, did very well was give the running game for Auburn a very difficult time, which traditionally has been their bread and butter. That seems to be, at least in my opinion, trending in a different direction under Hugh Freeze, although we had success running the ball against an FCS opponent in Alabama A&M. But you look at the score for this weekend, 73 points for Auburn, again, against an FCS school. Does that worry you at all when it comes to um, the Cal defensive back group? We've got these young, talented wide receivers that, again, in that particular game, in that context, did extremely well, led by another transfer, Keandre Lambert-Smith from Penn State. How concerned are you what you saw, at least on the surface, with the score and what who all got involved for the wide receivers against your defensive backs? Yeah, you look at the score and you see 73, you're like, oh, man, that's obviously a big number, one that sure. that should draw the eyes and should draw the you know, the P's and Q's of your coaches and players alike. Um, I look at the game last year against Auburn, really only Jay Fair and Rivaldo Fairweather could consistently get open at mm -hmm. any given time. Uh, this yep. year, it's a lot more different than that. You still have Fairweather. Oh, yeah. Now you got Lambert Smith, as you mentioned, Cam Coleman, Perry Thompson, uh, Malcolm Simmons, and the rest. You look at that, it's just a lot more boom and boom ability for the Auburn offense. In the same vein, I think Cal also got an injection of talent in the defensive back group. Craig Woodson, veteran safety is still there. Veteran defensive corner, uh, Noel Williams is there. Transfer Marcus Harris, from, who was an FCS All-American, is the other starting corner. Uh, he came from Idaho. And then really it's that only that last safety spot that's a little up for grabs right now between Miles Williams and Ryan Yates. So I look at their job specifically and I'm thinking they can do it. The mm -hmm. issue is, is that you also have offensive players who can also do it and be game breakers at it. So I've mentioned elsewhere saying you can theoretically hold Cam Coleman to three catches, but he could still have 90 yards and a touchdown because that's just the type <laughs> of athlete that he is. Right. And that even then, they wouldn't, you wouldn't say Cal did, did a bad job with that stat line. But sometimes mm -hmm. it's just like you get so many forces that come together. Eventually, someone's going to have to win out. And I go back to the discussion about the defensive line. The defensive line's pass rush and run support will make the secondary's life easier. Last year, it didn't It didn't work that way. The pass rush made life too difficult on the secondary. They were expected to plaster way too long, and as a result, were thoroughly ineffective. In this yeah. case, the pass rushes and run support is going to have to be big against Jarquez Hunter, and because of that, it'll help these guys in a vacuum to try and limit Lambert Smith, Coleman Thompson, and the rest of the group. Well, you've definitely familiarized yourself with the many threats that Auburn has found on its team offensively. Uh, and as the Auburn faithful will tell you, there is a lot of excitement about around them. I, again, try to wave the caution flag a little bit just in terms of trying to help 
emotional stability for our Auburn faithful about give these kids some time. Great start already for them. And who knows where they're going to head off, but we're about to face an FBS defense, whether it's consistent or not, this is going to be an extremely more difficult challenge for Auburn, even at home. We are excited to host you guys though, and see where this is going to head. Finally, Special teams, whatever you can share with us about that, that you'd like Auburn should be either looking for, where's our strength, the weakness, anything on your mind that Auburn faithful need to know about the Cal special teams. Yeah. So I think Auburn fans are, we're very familiar with our kicker last year. Mm -hmm. um, he is no longer on the team. So we have new kicker, Ryan Co. transfer from North Carolina, uh, made all his kicks week one, did as well as could be reasonably expected PATs, made a short field goal. Obviously, it's one thing to be making those comfortable kicks against UC Davis at home and go make them in a loud environment and Jordan Hare if you're being asked to make a 44-yarder for the win, for example. So that's one thing I really want to see, how far has the kicking game developed if called upon. But so far, early returns from camp in that first game are, are good. That's something that Cal fans are like, okay, we can lower our blood pressure by like one unit, only one unit. Mm -hmm. um, everything else, uh, the kick return and punt return game, it hasn't been a strength of this coaching staff over the course of the time. So last year, towards the end of the season, they said, all right, let's just put Jade not back there. It's, sometimes it's just a matter of let's put our best player out there and see what happens. And he had a monster kick return touchdown against UCLA that kind of shocked everyone saying, well, why not leave him back there all the time? Well, the hmm. problem is, as you look at it right now, one, he's hurt. But two, imagine he got hurt during a kickoff return when you need him to be the All-American level running back that he is. Right. And you look at that and you're like, well, we can't really do that on it. Luckily that UC Davis, they kicked away from Ott the whole time. And one of the up backs, Noel Williams, who's starting corner, ran all the way back himself. So possibly uh, the special teams coordinator, Vic Suoto, got some uh, got some additional guidance into the room and make them understand, hey, you got to also be a weapon for our team. Because when we're a defensive, we have, when we have a defensive minded head coach, special teams has to complement it every step of the way. And we haven't done that so far throughout this tenure. So that's where I kind of look at it and see, can Cal continually – increase the level of play that they showed throughout fall camp and this week one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's going to be one of those areas. I think that you, you never want to take for granted. You and I discussed this a little bit pre-show about how Cal fans are, are used to that. And I would say Auburn fans are as well. Um, and I don't just say this as just a recurring theme for it just to be there. There does seem to be a lot of similarities and things, whether we're at a different place as a program at a, in a different time, there does seem to be some, some similarities out there. The excitement is building for this game. I hope Cal fans uh, that are making the trip are really excited for this, uh, whether the outcome is in your favor or not. Um, Auburn fans traditionally are known for being very good hosts. Um, I can't vouch for <laughs> certain sex of the fan base, uh, but I can say that by and large, I continue to hear good things. So I hope that's the experience for anybody that's traveling, but let's get to the nitty gritty here. We, we've talked about offense, defense, special teams, what Auburn fans need to know about these Cal Bears. What do you think? Get, paint the picture for me from your perspective, where you're sitting now, What? how is this game going to go? And if you're ready, a score prediction. Yeah, um, I think all things considered, you can think about it. You're stepping into a new car. You just bought a new car. You're feeling great. I've made my first adult purchase. I just spent a lot of money to get a lot of things that I really want. And then you sit there and you're down a few cylinders. Mm -hmm. You don't really know why. In this case with Cal football, it's nothing really of their own doing. Injuries happen, you know, and in some cases you get stacks of injuries like you have right now. Because of that, I don't think Cal has all of the repertoire that they need to order in order to go in and win at Auburn. If you would ask me the same question 14 days ago, I'd be like, all right, we're going to go have a one score game and we're going to find out with two minutes ago what both of these teams are really made of. And now when I look at it, I think it's going to be a little bit more of a slow paced plotting game from the Cal side and trying to limit the amount of possessions that Auburn gets. And mm -hmm. because of that, I see it being like a one score game heading into the fourth, but one where I don't feel like Cal has enough in the holster to go out sure. and get over the top. So with mm -hmm. that being said, I have Auburn 28, Cal 17, um, if Cal had the full complement of players and they might still have some of them this Saturday, I would reconsider it because even then you still have to get into the discussion. Can Cal win a one score game? Cal under Justin Wilcox is about 13 and 24 in one score games, which obviously no matter how you slice it, it's just, that's not good enough. And right. I've stated on end that you've got to prove it to me. You have to show me that you're going to go out there and make a meaningful difference in a one score game. Should you get to that point? And because of all the injuries and everything else, I just feel like Cal may be a little bit, 
out of reach just if Auburn kicks like a late field goal to push it to 10 or 11 and Cal may not mm -hmm. just have enough to punch back at that point and just go punt for punt or turnover on downs versus punt the rest of the way. But that's really how I see it going because, yeah. you know, you wish you had your full amount of guys out there, but it's just sometimes yeah. just not how it works. Well, and, and as I said earlier, as a college football fan in general, you want the best uh, to appreciate that, to see a good game and all that stuff. And I do believe that we're going to have a great game. Um, I like the way you, you painted that out there, especially with what obviously a little bit of bias here, but what we consider one of the most difficult places to play in all of college football. Uh, there are Georgia players and Georgia's head coach has even talked about that at SEC media days. I think that's definitely going to be a factor. Uh, is it enough of a factor uh, to really break that cow uh, team in the end, as you said, maybe staying close, moving into the fourth quarter? Uh, we shall find out. But the Auburn, Auburn fans are definitely going to need to play their part in returning the favor of how difficult it, you all made it one year ago. Uh, over there in Berkeley, and uh, it was a night I'm sure to remember for for good reasons and bad reasons alike. But we're excited to complete yeah. this two this two game um, event that we've been uh, waiting a long time. I know I have, and uh, we're just really excited to get this thing done and and, and welcome you guys to the Plains. As a, a final note, or anything else that you'd like Auburn fans to know about Cal, or anything that you're excited about seeing or experiencing. Yeah, so we'll first reference last year's game. Uh, I think I would speak for both fan bases on this one. After that one, uh, both the fan bases looked at each other and they said, did either of us really win? <laughs> you had Pac-12 After Dark with West Coast fans. They're used to this. We've seen this same movie yep. uh, for years on end. You got people in the central time zone, the eastern time zone supporting Auburn, and they're watching the TV, and they're like, what did I just watch? Yeah. I don't want to ever, I don't have to fight that type of war ever again because there's no rhyme or reason to any of it. And yeah. that's really what Act 12 After Dark, that's what kind of the genesis of it was. You don't really know what's going to happen on any given week for any given reason. Um, to turn towards this year's game, uh, I will be making the trip. So I will be uh, wheels up Friday en route to Atlanta and eventually Auburn and looking to experience uh, Jordan Hare for my own, uh, my, with my own first experience. So mm -hmm. I'm intrigued to see what happens. Uh, I would almost want to probe you about it. What makes the game day experience uniquely Auburn in your mind? What makes the game day experience oh. tick for you? Oh man, that, that's such a long question. It's a great question. It's a long answer. In fact, we we're releasing a segment tomorrow for a recommendation of sorts that I have for all of you all. Uh, I tried to utilize that, what you just described, a, a Friday entering Atlanta, coming to Auburn, staying for the game. I'm assuming you'd be leaving Sunday. Is that correct? Or yeah, about like either Sunday? late Saturday night, Sunday morning. Okay, you're gonna need to listen to that in full. But in short, uh, you got if we're just stuff outside of football, you gotta go try Tumor's Lemonade, uh, Tumor's Drug Store. I don't know if you're a lemonade person, but uh, strawberry lemonade is my favorite. Uh, that one, I'd try to go eat at Mama Goldberg's. Definitely, definitely go experience Tiger Walk. Uh, you'll need to get there early because there's some construction going over in the area. But you want to be in your seats uh, at about. I'm trying to think about what the time frame will be for the War Eagle flight. As long as you're in the stadium an hour before kickoff, you won't miss anything really of significance in pregame. Um, but be ready for that War Eagle flight. It is unmatched, and it is one of the most unique and, and awe, I'm biased here, and awe-inspiring experiences in terms of traditions in college football. Um, plenty of other things I could go into, but I, I think that would be the essentials for you. Tiger Walk. War Eagle flight, go get you the tumors lemonade. And if you need something to eat, go to mama Goldberg. There's this not a sponsor here or anything, but <laughs> it's just a plug for a place that I love so much. Um, if I don't hope that gives you a good perspective or just a, a wash over of maybe what to expect. There's a lot there. Let's just say that's another tick on a tumors corner box right there. So I think uh, yeah. the more I hear tumors, I'm thinking, okay, well, we're going to have to make it to tumors. And yeah. I think I can expect reasonably, I think so. Cause Cal played Notre Dame two years ago at Notre Dame and they traveled. I would say about 12 to 14,000 fans showed up for that one. Uh, I would say the ballpark number is around seven to 10,000. That's the ballpark number I'm putting in for the okay. travel team for Cal fans to come out. And I know they're very excited because you know, it's not your run of the mill road game. You're not going to sure Kentucky to play Arizona State. You're not necessarily you're not going. It's not just Auburn. It's a yeah. destination. It's a college football destination. You know, the college football cathedral, if you will, in some cases with Jordan Hare. So I think Cal yeah. fans are very excited to make the trip. Of course, they want their team to come out on top. Will that happen? We don't really know. I wish right. I wish we had a concrete resolution to that. If it were easy, we'd play the game on paper. But it's not how it goes. You got to suit them up for 60 minutes and see what happens. And 
I know Cal fans will definitely be excited, and I know they'll definitely embrace Auburn fans as much how Auburn fans embraced Cal fans last year. Definitely hope that that's the story that we're talking about at the end of all this, no matter how it uh, shakes out. Hoping you guys have a great experience. As a final note to Cal fans, if you are interested, we do on our latest podcast have that segment, recommendations for Cal fans of what you might do on a Friday through Sunday scenario. Uh, we'll have, have that single segment out uh, probably by the time that you're hearing this podcast as well. And if you're interested, a college football 25 simulation of what might happen in the game. I don't know that I necessarily agree with the way things happen. The result might be okay. Uh, but that's something out there for you too, for Auburn and Cal fans alike, if they're interested in that. Uh, before we head out though, I would love for you to plug anything for yourself and uh, your organization. Where can the Cal fans and the Auburn fans find all the stuff they need to know about you? Yeah. So uh, I write for, uh, write for California, W R I T E F O R California.com. Uh, a fan site uh, built by Cal fans for Cal fans. And uh, awesome. we pride ourselves on wanting the best for the California Golden Bears, but not being afraid to let people know that things need to be better. Because we want sure. when you're built by a fan base, you want to represent them and make sure that you, you understand that their plights are worth hearing. So that's yeah. what we do. That's what I try and do with me being the beat writer for Right for Cal and something I'm going to try and, you know, showcase the emotion of what goes on good, bad and ugly out of Jordan Harris Stadium this Saturday. So I'm very excited. And uh, on Twitter, if anyone wants to follow my escapades down into Atlanta, Auburn for the weekend <laughs> uh, at Thomas Dunn 24 on Twitter. So I'm mean, very excited all around and I appreciate your time, Kyle, and I appreciate uh, the Auburn community welcoming me back for another year and of podcasting. Yes, thank you so much for joining us. We enjoyed every minute of it and looking forward to the matchup in Jordan-Hare, game two of Auburn versus Cal, coming up very soon. Until we talk to you again, War Eagle.